Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We pray that you are blessed by the sharing of God's truth for us this day. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Thank you, Albert. If you would, go ahead and take out your copy of God's Word and turn to what is probably the least often preached book of the Bible. The least often preached book of the Bible, which is ironic because this book, which is located in the back of the Bible, contains seven letters dictated from Christ to you. We're going to take a look over the course of the next few Sundays at the ministry of the book of Revelation. And, and I've got to, to tell you, I've been approaching this with a sense of fear and trembling myself because Revelation is not an easy book to study. Part of the reason that is, uh, is because there's a lot of idioms in it from the Old Testament, and as a New Testament church, oftentimes we don't concentrate on the Old. We flip through it, we highlight it as, as an anachronism, as something from the past that is not applicable today when that's anything but the case. Before you can understand the teachings of Christ, you have to know what Christ is referencing. What is the Bible that Christ preached out of? What is the Bible that the apostles after him preached out of? What are the words that John uses, the illustrations that, that John is imparted to pen for the believer to encourage them and to give him an indication of what is about to happen through this book of prophecy? All of it has its roots in the Old Testament, which is why we need to study it. But that's another sermon. For right now, we want to focus on what Christ is telling the churches. These are seven epistles, each intended to be read by and at a specific local church. They were written to address problems at a local church that... One, it did exist at one point in time in the case of the one that we're going to concentrate on. To also give an account, a report card, if you will, of some of the things that they're doing right, some of the things that they are not doing right, to instruct all Christians, because these are all open letters. At the end of them, you will hear the words, he who has an ear, let him hear. Meaning that this even though this is addressing the concerns of one specific local church, this is to be read and instructed to all churches, the capital C Church, the Church of Christ Universal. So the challenge that we have through the course of these next few messages is this. Where do we lie in all these? Which one of these seven churches reflects where we are what can we learn from them about what we're doing good? What can we learn about what we're not doing well? And what can we learn about the promises to the overcomer? The overcomer in this case means if there's a sin within the congregation, you get past that sin and you keep moving forward in the paths of righteousness that Christ is instructing us in. So let's open up also and a little bit more controversially, and I'll just put this out for your uh, instruction, is that the there are a few theologians out there that think that the order of churches, the order of churches that they're talking about, that uh, Christ teaches in these letters, there, there's not a geographic order. There is not a concern versus commendation order. There's not even an alphabetical order. So one of the things that a few theologians offer up is that this, there is a prophetic ministry within these books, within these letters, 
to instruct the believer on the phases that the capital C church will go through during the church age. That each of the letters not only addresses the local congregation, it's not only an open letter for all of us to learn from, but it's also a phase within the time of Christ's church. Just as a, a, a teaser for a few weeks down, read the letter to Laodicea in the way that the church is handling the society that it finds itself in today. But moving on. Let's start with a look at the book itself before we get into the letter. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads, and, is, and blessed is the one, those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. Now, what's strange about the fact that this is one of the least preached about uh, books of the Bible is the fact that this is the only book that I know of within the Bible who has the, if you'll excuse the phrase, chutzpah, to say, read me, I'm special. Every, all throughout the rest of the scriptures, there are admonitions to read the Bible as a whole, to read the scriptures. But this is the only book of the Bible that says there is a special blessing reserved for those who take this book seriously and who read it. Moving on. Skip down with me, if you will, to verse 12. John has been called by the Spirit to receive instruction for the small C churches and the capital C church. And after he begins his vision... Verse 12, I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. If you've been in the New Testament, you know that this is someone appearing as a high priest. That's the way that this, this dress is described. The hair of his head was as white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes were a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze, and his fired in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of cascading waters. This is someone of authority. This is someone of purity. This is someone of nobility. This is someone of power. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. What is the double-edged sword? You hear allusions to this all throughout Scripture, that this from God is sharper than any two-edged sword. What is the Bible talking about? Itself, the Word of God. See, there are codes, there are symbols and syllogisms within this Scripture, uh, points of phrase, but they're all explained for you. The mysteries of the book of Revelation have an explanation. In fact, more often than not, when Christ identifies something as mysterious or secretive, he tells you almost instantly what this means as we're about to see. His face was shining like the sun at full strength. So we have this strange scene of a heavenly temple Seven stars, seven points of light, and seven lampstands. The thing that holds the light. The thing that you set down so that the light can expound. This is basically an allusion to the temple of God. So you have the priest walking in the midst of the temple. Who is our great high priest? Jesus himself. As we said, the sharp two-edged sword, the word of God. And Jesus himself is about to tell us the rest of the story, what the mystery is. If we'll skip down to verse 19. Write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, the lights, in other words, and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
angel may be referring to a couple of different things. Angel from the Greek is angelorum, which translates to messenger. So it may very well refer to the created beings of God that we know when we talk about angels, the divine beings that circle the throne, but they may also refer to the message within the church itself, meaning the gospel, or those that carry the gospel within the church, or given the allusion that he has to the seven spirits of God, it may refer to the Holy Spirit. Either way, the three interpretations that can be found in theology are this. These are either the representation of the Holy Spirit of God through the tongues of flame, or they're an actual angelic messenger who keeps the church going and protects it, or it's the gospel residing within the church. Either way, if you hear him say that your star will be removed from its place, the church is gone. If the Holy Spirit is pulled out of a church, the church loses its power. It loses its ability to connect with God personally. If it loses an actual angel, it loses its protection. It loses its divine mandate. If it loses the gospel, then it's not a church. The lampstand is the church. The lampstand is a giant piece of brass where a candle is, well, excuse me, a lamp is fit on top that provides light. So it itself is not the light, it shows the light, meaning that it's us. We are not the light. The light comes from God. We reflect it. We hold it. We extend it to others. This is the function of a local church. Are you with me so far? This is to give you a bit of background and vocabulary so that when Jesus talks to the church of Ephesus, which is the church we're going to look at right now, you understand what he's meaning when he uses these symbols. So let's take a look in chapter 2 at the church at Ephesus. The busy church. Hmm. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. This is the pattern of the letter. In fact, the pattern of almost all of these letters works a little something like this. Write this down in your notes. What title does Jesus use of himself? What is the name of the local church? And what is the name's significance? What are the commendations? These are basically seven report cards. So what are the, what are the things that you're doing good? Then what are the concerns? What are the things that you need to improve? What does Jesus promise the overcomer? These are things that we need to consider. Ephesus, just for the sake of, well, let me read through, then I'll come back and we'll, we'll go through that a little bit. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands says, I know your works, your labor, your endurance, that you cannot tolerate evil people, that you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. And you have found them to be what? Liars. So this is a church that doesn't tolerate poor doctrine. Verse 3, I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. This is a church that is busy with the work of the kingdom. Now, really quickly, before we go any further, let's take a look at the things that we've already covered. First of all is the name Ephesus. The word Ephesus means the darling one or the beloved one. And throughout the rest of this letter, Jesus uses that language. Ephesus, the name itself, suggests a romantic relationship. What do you know about romantic relationships concerning Christ? The church itself, the capital C church, is referred to as the what of Christ? 
the bride of Christ. So a lot of the, the language that Jesus uses to make his point has that language as part of it. And here are the commendations. Also, Jesus, uh, the, the title of himself, he talks about the seven stars that he has in his hand, meaning that those with, that which protects your church or that which connects your church with God or that which you are to proclaim, whatever interpretation we want to use, he controls it. It's all in his hand. Whether you succeed or fail, whether you live up to your purpose or whether you are snuffed out as a congregation, that's all up to him. And at the same time that he has dominion and power over the church, he is walking among the lampstands, which means he is walking among the churches. He is here. Where two or more are gathered there, I will be in the what? Midst of them. So he who is our great high priest is telling us about himself that he is in control. And not only is he in control over us, he is right here with us. His beloved ones. The commendations that this church labors and labors with endurance. That it cannot tolerate evil. That when it sees a problem, it addresses the problem. It preaches against the problem. It proclaims the gospel in the face of adversity. It also tests those who are in authority. It puts them through the ringer to make sure that what they are doing is correct. Remember, and I preach about this often, Acts 17, 11, where Paul declares that the the Christians in Berea were more noble in spirit because they, ex- they accepted the word of God with all willingness of heart, and yet they searched the scriptures daily to prove that what Paul had said was so. Meaning that it wasn't just good enough to hear it from the pastor's mouth. They went through the scriptures. They went through the books. They went through the synagogue. They remembered and learned for themselves why they believed what they believed. And then when someone came up proclaiming authority, apostolic authority, they were tested and they were tried to make sure that what they were preaching was indeed from the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and not false doctrine. They didn't put up with people just trying to tickle the ears. They had a lot of programs, did a lot of good work, were a source of mercy and the spreading of the gospel to many. But then, as with any evaluation, after you hear the good that you've done, you dread the word, but. Verse 4. And this is a big one. But I have somewhat against you. I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you've fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Work on what is most important. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Let me address that before we move on. The first love, first love, first refers to order of primacy. What is most important? What is most important to any church or any group of believers in all of Scripture? When Jesus himself was asked, which of the commandments is the greatest, what did he respond with? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. You lost your first love. You lost the love that you should have for what is most important. Who is the most important person in the life of any local church? God himself. What he's effectively saying is that you have become so busy doing the work of the kingdom that you don't have any time for the king. 
that you are so invested with all of your programs, with all of your trips, with all of your finances, with all of your uh, engagements, that you've forgotten to love God. The programs of the church are here ruling the church. The machinery, the red tape, everything that, that, that is necessary for the maintenance of order has now forgotten the reason it's there to begin with. We have programs for the, sense, for, for the sake of having programs. We are doing things for the sake of doing things. All these trips, all of these meetings, all of this busy work is precisely that, it's busy work. Remember the name of Ephesus, what it means, my darling one. Has anyone ever dated someone that was so busy all the time that they were dating in name only? Or they're married. On paper, it says that you are husband and wife. And yet you are so devoted to your job that the person that you are called to love in that relationship has been left out of the picture. You have lost your first love. Or more literally, you have lost your love for what should be most important. So busy with the work of the kingdom, you have no time for the king. But there's another but, thankfully. You do have this, verse 6. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I'll talk about that for just a second, because this is in the context of the letter. And this is also a cancer in any local church. Nicolaitans is an untranslated word. The two Greek words that are fused together to form it. Neko and Laos. Neko is the Greek version of victor. It means he who conquers. Laos means the people. Nicolaitan, when translated, renders those who conquer or those who have authority over the people. Now, in effect, what he's saying is there are those who have tried to work their way into your congregation who use the name of Christ to obtain a kind of mock political power over the people who are your members. People who are not only your, your preachers and your teachers, but they are trying to tell you, they're trying to strip you of your freedom in Christ. They're trying to exercise political power over you extorting your soul for their own personal gain. Are you with me so far? This is a cancer within the body of Christ. It still is today. Those who are in positions of teaching authority who use that position of power, of ecclesiastical power, meaning the ability to teach, the ability to preach, the ability to draw alongside those who are hurting, who use that ministerial influence instead for a type of political gain, or personal gain at any rate. Now to talk about those that will overcome, as well as what happens to those who are overtaken. <clears throat> the last verse of the chapter. Oh, excuse me, the last two verses. Verse 19. Write what you have... <clears throat> I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong page. Verse 7, last verse. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. This is Christ admonishing each and every one of us um, to read this open letter, that it's not just specific to this one church, but this church is a type, it's an example for us to hold a mirror to ourselves and see how we are doing. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the overcomer, I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
Can you imagine when this is all said and done, the honor that it would be on an individual believer to be served by Christ? And not just any reward, but the reward that was abandoned in the Garden of Eden. Two beautiful trees in the middle of that garden. One that brought death, the other guaranteed to bring life. The one that was guaranteed to bring life was not forbidden to them until they had sinned. To those who love Christ and his Father with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their might, this is their crown. This is their reward. Everlasting life. The gift of not only eternal salvation, but the honor of coming from Christ himself. This, is, this letter is short, but it has a profound message. There is a danger in being part of an organization. And that danger is that through the business of the organization, a person can get trapped. A person becomes a number. A person becomes a function. A person ceases to be a person because in the organizational hierarchy of things they end up becoming an object. The church is designed to be an organism, a life form. Christ describes it as such in not just any life form but his own beloved bride. So the question that this letter raises to us, the challenge that it offers us, is to remember the reason that we're here in the first place. While he's identifying one great commandment, remember that there are also two more. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. And the second as the first, you shall love your neighbor as in that communion, a new one I give you that you love one another. This is the simple antidote to the problem that was being faced by the church at Ephesus. The way that you stop being all about the programs, being all about the rules, being all about the law, you remember your first love. That instead of loving the work you love the one who you are doing the work for. And if you put that first, everything else will come into place. The church is a body of believers, yes, but it's also a family. Many last names, oftentimes many opinions, but one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. This is who the church, the local church, is meant to be. And while we're talking about it, the attractional nature of the church in which we live in right now seeks to return us to the Ephesian model. You want to attract more members? Have the bigger praise band. Strike everything in the sanctuary that resembles a sanctuary. Put in new lights, put in smoke machines. Have a program for everything else under the sun. Hire a new minister to take over the jobs that should be conducted by the church membership. If you, as a visitor, go to a church for the church's trappings, who are you worshiping? The thing about local church membership is that God calls us to a person not so that we can shop for a congregation like you go to Walmart to shop for a pair of sneakers. 
a church membership is based on the love you have for God, your degree of obedience to Him, and the recognition of the Holy Spirit leading you to a place where you can be loved and to love the people that you are serving alongside. Not to be served, but to, just as Christ did, to serve. If there's a church that you feel loved in, that doesn't have a children's ministry, it's your job then to be part of the solution to help, not simply to go to another church because they offer something different. Not to shop around, but to be part of the family, to meet the family's needs, and to do something that will engage you in loving the people that you're with and loving God. That's what built this church. It, didn't, it wasn't born with a gigantic building and a program for everything known to man that came out because the people who founded it loved God, loved each other, and wanted to see a place that was safe where they could come together and experience both that love for him and that love for everybody, a place where people could be discipled, a place where people could be loved, to know Christ, to make Christ known. first love of any church should now and forever always be Christ. And anything that the church engages in should be a direct result from that love. And all God's people said. Heavenly Father, as we draw close to you in this time of invitation, examine our hearts This is one book of seven. This is one letter of seven. One mirror that we are staring into. Help us to learn from the mistakes of others that we might be those who overcome. That when that day arrives, we may be the ones found faithful. To devote ourselves entirely to you as we come to your throne now if there are any whose hearts are hanging in the balance, whose hearts are pulled down because of worry and frustration and things that, that only you can answer, Lord, whatever the need is on any heart, be it the need to call you Savior for the first time, be it the need to find a place where they can be loved, be it the need to let go of a sin that's been hampering their hearts and their joy be it the need to just express themselves to you and your throne of grace, whatever the need is. Draw that person close to you now before it is everlastingly too late. Join with us. Take us as we are and inspire us to become more and more like the image of your Son. In the matchless name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us at High Lawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. We believe that when you love God, you share His Word. And when you love others, you spread the gospel. We hope that you're planning on joining us next time and would love for you to join us in person. To learn more or to donate to our ongoing ministry, please visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you and may God bless you and keep you.